Welcome to I Would Uncut, an event designer's podcast. I'm your host, Lucy Molina, and in today's podcast episode, I have a very special guest that really adds beautiful bespoke details for events. Marcy. Hi, Lucy. Hi, and welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me so much. I appreciate it. Thank you for taking the time, and you have so much to share, especially yes. the fact that you're such a crafts like your craftsmanship is amazing thank you which we'll I, get into. I will i would love to yes we will definitely so marcy tell us a little bit of who you are and sure. what you do in this industry to those of you that do not know but make sure to follow her handles that are on the screen so i have been doing wedding and events for over 35 years now um, i started out on the side of catering sales um, actually, even before that, I started out in room, the rooms division, handling all of the big group sales um, uh, blocks of rooms for major, m major big hotels, uh, you know, over almost a thousand, thousand sleeping rooms, and we'd have huge conventions. We were right across from the convention center. So we would have these massive events, and um, I was actually asked to come upstairs and work in the catering and sales department so that I can um, really hone um, my further intentions in the industry. The process was that I started there, continued on, got my education while I was working full time. Um, so I went to school at nighttime and I wound up in, um, in the field of the catering world for a good portion of maybe 15, 20 years. Okay. And then I started on the side of uh, invitations. And the way that I actually, it's a funny story, but the way that I actually got into it was while I was working in catering sales, I was also, um, I was working in as finding an invitation for myself for my own wedding. And while we were looking, I just felt like I really wasn't seeing what I wanted to see. Although I will say the industry has come a long way. Oh my when God! I yes. was looking. I mean, Wasn't it before like a big binder? Yes. People just you got to only choose whatever they had. They nothing were custom. <laughs> minuscule <laughs> offerings back then, and now the plethora. I mean, it's like it's exploded. But um, the girl that I was working with when I was looking for invitations, super knowledgeable about what component she had but didn't have a lot to offer in the way of etiquette and things like that and I think that that's part of the process um, and finding the right vendors and so forth so as nice as she was I felt there was an opportunity once I was ready to get onto the other side that that really was an area that I could excel in um, and she actually got out of the industry so it was kind of like perfect timing for me to step in and fill a void that I didn't see in our area at that point. So you would say that in your process of trying to get an invitation for your own wedding, next thing you know, you're like, wait, this is a, a market that I can get into. What were some yes. of the thoughts that were going through your mind as you're entering this whole new business sector? Like, like what was your mind? Like, okay, do I need to take classes? Do it? Like, where do I get paper? Like, what was going through your I mind? I had nowhere to find information except for just doing a lot of research on my own, contacting a lot of um, people in the industry from across the country, talking to them, learning about different kinds of papers, learning about different print methods. It was a huge learning process. I mean, an enormous okay. amount of time spent learning the craftsmanship and so forth. So that and all was the classes time consuming. You, right, yes. and all the classes I, I assume like you had to take and the patience and the determination too, because yes. you're going, you are an entrepreneur. So being that you also had to keep yourself accountable and on track. So how did you find like that focus, especially starting I a whole just, new business? Yeah. It's just something that when I think when you find something that you're passionate about and you really like to do a product or a service with people that you enjoy doing it for, I think that's when things work out the best. That's when you're going to put the time and the effort into something. You're going to be more, it's going to be more engaging and fun for you. So although it's work, I still have fun. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I really, I think that's part of the mix. It's, it's, a, it's a mix of things that keep you involved. And I'm constant, I mean, I, I'm still constantly learning because there, there are just so many things coming out. Things are much as, because of technology, things are a lot faster these days. Trends are faster, uh, fads are faster. And you know, obviously there's a difference between a fad and a trend. 
Um, yeah. So those are things that, you know, we have to pay attention to in the industry so that, you know, you want to make sure that you're going to provide your clients with the needs that they're looking for that are going to match their personality, their style, and so forth. Absolutely. And now you've been in this industry for what, like 50? Over 17 years now. Over 17 years. That is amazing. 17 years. Yes. What would you tell yourself when you first started now knowing what you know? <laughs> I would probably say, well, actually, nowadays, it's a lot easier to find information. Um, but there is a such a plethora of places to, and resources to get the information. So find out and speak with people across the country to find out where they should best focus their efforts. Um, because in the beginning, it really was, I had to take a long time to really ramp up. Yeah. And, you know, nowadays, I feel like when you jump into something and you don't know something, you, it can be overwhelming. So you don't want to put your focus on the wrong areas. For sure. And, you know, you have so much knowledge. And I have to ask you, when you were first starting your business or even you know, as you progress through the whole process, what were some of the struggles and things that you had to, you felt like you really had to overcome? Because starting a new business, you get all these fears, there's like anxiety, the unknown. And I applaud you because going into a whole different industry where you're like, like you said, you saw that there's a market for it and you liked it, but you had like, that it's, it's, it's very courageous. So what are some of the things that you had to deal with in that process? I think the biggest thing for me is like, don't put yourself, don't put your emphasis on your client's um, desires because it may not necessarily be your, uh, your style 100%. You need to really understand that. And I kind of knew this going into it, but um, you know, you really need to step back and listen to your clients first. That's the most important part. If you're not listening to your clients, you're not going to understand what their needs are. Um, that would be the biggest thing that if I was telling somebody else who's looking to get into it now, that would be one thing to really think about is that you need to keep that open mind that you don't want to impart your personality because this is their wedding or yeah. their event. And it's the same with yes. even decor and design. Absolutely. A lot of the times I always tell students in the class, I'm like, you're getting into this business because you want to make someone's dream vision come to life, not ours. Right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, I mean, I think that's the biggest part. I mean, you know, there was, I, I mean, I will admit, you know, there are t challenges. Sometimes, you know, you'll get something in um, from, a mat you know, material might come in and it's not 100% to your satisfaction. And I certainly am not going to pass that on to my clients. So I, you know, have to, to deal with, everything. you know, you know, the challenges of making sure you're going to get it in on time to, you know, meet their needs of when they want to send something out so forth. So it's like even quality control, you're very yes. specific on that, which is important. It is. And in that process, again, of, you know, what were some of the good points that you felt like once you, you know, you like you said, you dealt with the challenges, but what were some of the good stuff that you were just like, okay, I'm on the right track, on, especially on those days that you know how you get so frustrated? Yes. What were some of those moments that were like? <laughs> I, th I, I think my biggest thing is that when people come to pick up their invitations in the end, or, you know, their components that they're, maybe their menu cards or your, their napkins and so forth. I love it when they open up the box and they see what they've got. You know, they and it's like they get so excited and that feeling is just exciting for me to watch them get excited. Yeah, absolutely. What are some of the different trends you see or changes? Like you mentioned technology is changing the industry so much, which yes. I agree because we were talking earlier about Everyone's seeing online those invitations that have like the little video clip and you open it up and it looks like a little mini iPad. Yes. And we were talking how expensive they are, but how, what are some of the things you're seeing change in the industry from before when you first started to now? I think, you know, I mean, I think you're going to always see the beautiful papers such as the cotton papers, whether it's white or cream, ivory and so forth. We've got some back here. Um, and so forth. But I think you're always going to see different trends in the way of 
uh, printing methods. You're going to see some different embellishments. I mean, right now, for example, um, this invitation here has a bow, and right in the trend right now, obviously, bows are super hot. So I think that's kind of one of the trends that we're going to see. Um, another one being foil, and it always used to be that they would be um, imprinted foil, imprinted being pushed into the paper, mm. whereas now they're doing, they're still doing that, and it's gorgeous. But now you're also going to have an option to do maybe something like a raised foil. Very so nice. that would be a t uh, another um, option of a trend. Um, another trend would be the laser cut invitations, which are super modern, um, different intricacies. Sometimes you can find them that are going to maybe match your color or your theme, you know, if it's a f certain flower. Sometimes we can work with that. Um, Italian is extremely going into Italian 20, aesthetic. 2025 you're going to see a lot of Italian and a lot of Parisian influences so something like this where it's you know you've got like the Italian tile look um, Very that's beautiful. super hot but yeah. that's going to be a bit I think that's going to be a big trend um, it's already starting to take way in across the country when you're seeing a lot of outdoor outdoor um like outdoor wedding and uh, dinners and so forth where they have the big long tables and oh, yeah. under the trees and so forth um, in Florida it's a little bit more challenging it is for <laughs> sure but Florida I will say that a lot a lot of people do love the outdoor yeah, weddings they do but this theme is perfect because it lends itself to be really fresh and different exactly especially bringing like that masculine feminine type of color right palette. it's it's nice for a wedding I mean, this goes super well. You could pair something like this and even do like a menu card for this. Oh, yeah. Super cute if you do like that with like lemons and maybe some minimal flowers. And then you, again, you still have that, you know, masculine and feminine, but you know, not overly feminine. Correct. It's a good so balance. It's a good balance. Um, blues, as you can see, I've got a few blues today. Uh, blue is definitely a big color. Um, I, we all wait for the Pantone color of the year, which will be out in December. Yes. Um, but, have you had any but, peach fuzzes this year? I have not had too much peach fuzz. No, it's not a color it's that not a lends big color. Yeah. No, it's not an easy color I to think, blend. Yeah, with to other blend colors. with other things. Yeah. I think that's you know. I think a lot of couples maybe they're putting a little bit of an accent, but not much. Because I think when they get to the peach tone, they basically just go pink. Yes, <laughs> I, yes. I feel like that's what I see. Like or blush after, or blush, right? Or like a mauve tone, but they won't just commit to the full peach. They're like right. it goes always towards the pink side because also there's not a lot of peach inventory, like linens and things. It's really tough to find. It's a tough match. Yeah, it is. Actually, I have one, um, the one tomorrow that uh, their their accent color is coral. So it's it's a stronger color than peach, but it's still kind of in the same family. Oh, okay, yeah, it's within yeah, yeah the same family. Um, and then you know, of course, acrylics. Acrylics are always going to one. be gorgeous. And you know, this one is really cute because you know you can put something on the back, maybe the couple's name and their wedding date and so forth. So, you know, there's a lot of influences now that really kind of are across the board, and it's really about finding the best style for you because what is going to work for that couple? For sure. So Marcy, as you know, on Uncut, I want to, honestly, how much do these things cost? At least a ballpark, <laughs> because I yes. feel like everyone, even like whether you're a bride watching or someone getting, you know, planning a wedding or anything like that, you're wondering like, what is the what invitation cost? Like, what's the range? What's a good budget for invitations? Okay, so right now the budget invitations which are more like the cost conscious client um, your invitation itself is going to be between three to five dollars each each and then uh, the next one up would then be your traditional which is you know something uh, in the more of the mid-range something like the um, the rectangular styles with um, just like maybe either digital printing or maybe um, letterpress printing those are go well digital I would say is going to be about five to ten dollars, um, and then luxury would be between ten and twenty-five, and then bespoke, which is typically what I do, which is about twenty-five and up uh, each. each However, invitation. I do offer more than just bespoke. I just my my aesthetic is more bespoke, but I try to offer more of a personalized feel for those who may not necessarily fit that budget. So I do have a pretty broad range. Yeah. 
And what would you say, like, you know, you, I like how you put it into different tiers. Yes. Which I think to anyone who's in the design business, having things into different tiers helps even the client process and experience. So they're able to kind of say, okay, I'm within this budget. This is kind of like my range. And that way, you as a designer, you're able to say that these are, this is what I could do for you then. Right. And when you say bespoke, let's say I come with a crazy idea, you're able to make anything custom. Yes. So something like that, I, I, you know how people are now doing like the, the portfolio type of openings, like they're very like sturdy books that the cost, yes. I can't imagine how much that costs to ship. So like back over here, if you can see, there's a black invitation over there. Um, that invitation, it typically would cost about six, $6 to ship. So um, the uh, product is, it's really about the, the weight of it and the dimensions of it. So when you bring it to the post office, because you do have to have everything assessed by the post office these days, um, I recommend having them look and see what is it going to cost before you actually put the stamps on them. Gotcha. So and before you purchase the stamps, because sometimes they're a little bit, you know, they're either a little more or they could be a little less. I mean, you know, something as standard as the um, rectangular uh, cream invitation, something like that, maybe about two stamps a piece, two forever stamps that is. So that's not as costly to mail, but something that has some weight to it and the folder is, has weight, everything has weight when you add it up. Also, when you have embellishments, sometimes the bow protrudes, that may be a factor for the post office. Um, or if you have What's crystals, which you don't see that seen? much. Um, mailing most, wise? Yeah, mailing wise. Uh, <laughs> I actually, Oh, you got to take a. I actually, yeah, sorry, I actually I had. Like, I, I got, I got the price yeah. for you. <laughs> so I actually had to do this about two years ago, I believe it was. I actually had a client getting married at the Ritz. Okay. They wanted all their guests to receive them overnighted. What? And they were I can't like, imagine the cost of overnight. They were like, literally, I would say, oh my goodness, if I want to say somewhere around forty a piece. Oh my Just God. for overnighting, because some of them were not in the country too. So I would say the average was about forty a piece. Wow. Yes. Just to to mail it. That's not even less. the invitation yet. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I think the invitation was not even that range. Oh but my yeah. God. Wow. Yeah, they were they were pretty. It pricey. was last minute too. I it mean, was a last minute, right? And and that's the thing, you know. We I always say to people, plan ahead because. When you work last minute, A, you're going to pay a lot more on rush fees. You're going to pay more on the shipping um, to send it to your guests. You may have to overnight them. Um, but those are the things that you really, it's up to the person, the stationary person, to provide that information. But also, as somebody looking for invitations, those are the things that you want to do. You want to make sure you're ordering them enough time out. Um, I would say for invitations, I would recommend ordering your invitation five to six months out in advance. You can do less time, but your options are going to be more limited. Limited for sure. Yes. And what would you say some of the do and don'ts in invitations, especially let's say when your clients are coming to you and they're requesting all these beautiful Pinterest ideas that are almost like not even real. <laughs> <laughs> so what are some of the do's and don'ts in invitation design, would you okay. say? Okay, so I think some of the things that people don't realize is when you're doing printing methods, if you're doing more than one printing method, that is an additional cost to the product. So for example, like this one here, we have two printing methods. You have this, the raised foil, um, or no, this is an imprinted foil, and then you have, um, this feels like a letter press. So you're going to have more cost to the product when you're doing more than one printing method. You're also going to have more cost sometimes when you're doing more than one color mm. ink. Um, the only time that it doesn't always factor out is when you're doing digital. Because digital, you can usually get by on doing more. You can get by with a little bit more. So, um, But when you're doing more than one printing color, um, that's an option. Everything is an it's basically that everything is an a la carte price, but work with a stationer who's going to give you a bottom line. And the reason being, when you put a package together, it's going to give you everything in one shot. You don't want to be overwhelmed. You're, you want to know what is it going to cost you in the end. So get with somebody who's going to give you that cost so that you can get the best, A, bang for your buck, your best knowledge, and you're going to have all the details you want. You don't have to worry about all the, you know, everything. I mean, when you want to do guest addressing on the front, 
printed return address on the back flap, those things are also factored in um, if you tell your stationary person what your expectations are. And that's the most important part. As a, you know, as a client, be honest and upfront with your stationary person because um, tell them your budget, tell them the, you know, what you're looking for. Your needs and, and your wants. Your needs and wants because I, ultimately they're, going, they're there to help you, but if you're holding back on information and they have to add it in after the fact, that's, um, you know, it's going to be, cause a little bit of a backlog in providing the information that you're really needing in a time frame that you might want. Absolutely. And you had spoken about something key, the etiquette process that it is to create invitation. Like, yes. What is the key necessities that invitation requires that you say are a must so or on, recommended? Right. So on an invitation, the top line or lines are going to be for your host, the person who is hosting the event. So like, let's dissect like yes. one of these, maybe this one. This one is great. Yes. So um, this one talks about... I'm not. <laughs> um, so this one has actually the couple's parents' names. Sometimes it's not the parents that are giving the invitation, but maybe it's the couple. The couple. So you can actually do a totally different spin on it and do something like this, where it's the couple's names at the top, mm. um, which is really pretty. I mean, it, it's really about like who's hosting it. That would be one facet. You also want to make sure to include the couple's names, and if they want to or don't want to use their middle names or middle initials, it's important to find that out. Um, the word and versus to, um, it's, that's a choice, but um, typically on a, depending on the religion, that may play a factor. So for Jewish invitations, um, you would have an and. For um, if it's in a place of worship, you would have an and. If it's not, then they have the choice of. Um, ladies' names in America typically go first mm -hmm. versus if it's a man, uh, it would typically be second. But in South America, that is different. You know, it's the reverse. Yeah, yeah it's the reverse. So so you really have to find that's out. A good, that's, yes. that's a very key point right there. It depends on also their culture and, yes. and where they're from. Exactly. I mean, there's so many facets that you have to pay attention to to make sure that you're getting all the details that's important to that couple. Because even though they may be getting married here, the majority of their get guests may be from overseas or you know South America or something that they need to tailor it to their desires and to their style. Um, na uh, this, the day of the week, the date, you can spell it out or you can write it out, um, and then the uh, time and location. Of the reception. Of the reception. I always recommend putting whether or not, you know, the attire, if you want to put the attire on, I always recommend putting that right on the invitation. Um, if you want to give further details, you may want to elaborate on that on your, um, on your wedding, um, uh, what do they call that? The, yeah, the website, if you're doing a website. And then I see there's like a, a little... Yes, so this is a, what's called a base hay on the upper right hand side, um, and that is a, a symbol for good luck for a Jewish wedding. Oh. So that would be uh, one facet. And then, you know, obviously the enclosure cards. Every, you know, every client's needs are different. Whether or not you're doing something online, this client decided they wanted to do a QR code. I always say if you're going to do a QR code, also put the URL because you will have couples or you will have people that may not necessarily know how to use a um, a QR code very well, so give them the URL as well. I mean, especially so for older couples. This is something couples, that they could do to RSVP. Yeah, and this is something they could do to RSVP. Yes. Instead of sending back yes. their response, they are just able to do it through the website. Correct. Mm -hmm. Correct. I mean, a lot of people really like to receive the responses back because they're they get excited. They run out to their post box, pull out all their you know RSVPs, yeah. and that's they get excited that way. But some couples they do want to put something. It's very online. modern. Yeah. It's very <laughs> modern. Um, it also will save a little money on the stamps because then you don't have to put a stamp on a RSVP envelope. Gotcha. So that's an additional way to you know to capture some money. Um, direction cards are always favorable because you know people sometimes need directions on where to go, where to park, things like that. Those are important. 
So um, there is where you would put information, like if there's valet or if there's like yes. a paid parking or something. Correct. Gotcha. Yes. Very interesting. Um, and then, you know, if you're doing like a brunch or a, um, a pre-wedding dinner or something of that nature. Like a rehearsal dinner. A rehearsal. Or a welcome right, party. A welcome party. Mm -hmm. Those are also things that you would probably want an enclosure card for. And then they, they would just, I mean, for this one, it would just tuck right in. So that would be, um, those would be the highlights of, of an invitation. Very beautiful. It's, I, I have to say, especially now, I feel like a lot of people put more focus and emphasis on the aesthetic of their invitation because you have to remember, this is the first kind of it's the first Symbol. tangible yeah. item they see. It's the first kind of like little sneak peek yes. of what to expect for the couple's special day. Right. So seeing the invitation, you already get to see some of the, like a peekaboos of like what the color concept's going to be. Like you get little hints of what the theme is. So it's it's really like the first, like most important, like tangible item that yes. your wedding process, like that's the kickoff to your wedding. Right. And then they, you know, your guests, even if they see the attire, it's going to give them a little bit more of a glimpse into what the expectation of the evening is going to be or the day is going to be. So it's important to that you're kind of matching it where in a way that it doesn't have to be matchy matchy, but it, it the tone has to be the same. The vibe has to be the same. So you want to make sure that if you're having something in a beautiful hotel or a venue, you want to make sure that your invitation sets the tone for that location because mm -hmm. you know you don't want to necessarily get something that doesn't really match that vibe because then the expectation is well where is it going to be in this place is it going to be in a hotel room or is it going to be in a ballroom you know i mean yeah. like it's it sets the it's vibe it sets the vibe that's that's a, that's a perfect way of putting it and what how do you feel or what are your thoughts on this marcy with everyone doing more of the digital invitations you know how some people are doing, some yes. couples are opting for that. I've been seeing it on TikTok and I'm like, it, I don't know. I feel like it loses like a little bit of sense of, yeah. of the whole wedding. Pro like this is the first thing that sets off like your wedding festivities, I feel like. You know, Lucy, I get asked this question a lot because I think that, you know, we do live in a technology and digital yes. age. But I think that ultimately your wedding is forever. It's something that you will always remember. And your guests are, will remember it as well. If you provide them with the right, um, the right feeling. And I think that when you receive something in the mail and you open it up and it's beautiful invitation, that evokes a different emotion than when you open up your email and you click the button and open up that invitation. I just, I don't think that there's a really much of a comparison. It's just, you know, that it's the feeling that, that your guests are going to get they get excited they're like oh my gosh this is a gorgeous invitation you know like i can't wait you know and it it kind of evokes more of a, a higher um a higher emotion out of it for sure and would you say a lot of the times when it comes to couples and clients even putting invitation orders because i, I feel like bar mitzvah bat mitzvahs quinceaneras are all the same as a wedding now yes um what would you say is one of those main factors that a lot of these clients are asking for in terms of the more is more or is it more simplistic that we're seeing or, or you know like what what are you what are people asking of you more in terms of like aesthetics um i'll tell you i get a i get a mix um because i do have clients that will come in and they want over the top wow and then i'll have the, i'll have a lot of clients i would say the majority of my clients are more in the classic traditional right now um, is kind of more on the, of the trend. Um, but I do think that 2005 is going to bring, I think, an elevated look than 2004. But I also feel like 2004 is going to have more guests than 2005. I think the guest count might come down a little bit. And then your guests... So you're saying for next year, it'll be more of... Like, instead of being, so you would say this year is micro weddings or next year are micro? I wouldn't say micro. They're just smaller. Um, you know, a micro wedding is, you know, under 50. Yeah. Well, I do see a lot of people going overseas. Yes. That is something that I, I'm seeing everyone. And I love how online everyone sees the beautiful weddings in Capri and everything, but that still costs money. It's just less people, but it's because not everyone's going to pay over a thousand dollars for a flight ticket. Right. And I think the reason that you'll, you're seeing that is because it is, you know, it's, it's putting on an event or wedding. 
you're still there's still cost too, and I think that they're trying to alleviate some of their own costs. Mm. So by having their guests absorb some of that cost by doing like a, you know, a trip of some sort together, it's going to take off that pressure. Um, but I think that's why I think a lot of people that are getting married here, they're going to go into more of that smaller wedding field, maybe 50, 60, 70 people, as opposed to like. 100 300 and, and, you know, and 200. Yeah, really, <laughs> really. And, you know, some cultures, you know, it, the more the better. You know, I mean, like if you have an Indian wedding, they're expected, you know, 300 and up. Yeah. Um, you know, they, they do a large, and they do it over several days. So there's that factor as well. So you really have to know. Guests. I know. Oh can you God, imagine? No, <laughs> I cannot. No. <laughs> oh, That's yeah. a lot of people. It is a lot of people. How many invitations for 300 people? Would well, it depends on the people, the number of um, people in the um, in the home. So, typically, I say that if you are somebody who you know, like you're sending an invitation and you're sending it to a family, and let's say the kids all live home, let's say they're all adults, but they all live home. Typically, if they're over the age of eighteen, they really typically should get their own invitation. Oh, over eighteen. That's over a really 18. good thing to. I didn't know that. Yes. Um, but sometimes you're going to have people that are just going to say, and family. Yeah. Um, and then in certain cultures, you do have to be very clear, because when you say, and family, to some people, and family could be an extended family. Oh, so my you God. Really so it's should like the be, cousin of the cousin. Right. So I always say, you know, my feeling is when you're sending an invitation, put the people's names on the invitation envelope. I agree. Yes. Don't you put, like, Mr. and Mrs., like, Smitty? Or Mr. Right. and Mrs. Uh, Mr. and Miss, like how how do you the, what is the appropriate way to do that? So I would put Mr. and Mrs. Smitty, Mr. and, and Mrs. Amount Robert, of people too. Mr. and Mrs. Robert Smitty. Yeah. And then underneath, if you have the, if they have children that you want to put their names, I would say Ms. M I S S, Miss um, Holly, or Miss you know Mr. Well, Master so Timothy, yeah. or something of that nature, because I think that you really want to make sure that you're telling them who actually is invited. Otherwise, you're leaving it to them to arbitrarily make the decision. You're going to receive the response back, and it might be for like 10 people. That's insane. <laughs> Can you imagine? I open it, I'm like, 10 people? Oh, my God. Right. And then oh. you have to call them and say, you know what? This I meant that only for you, right. too. <laughs> Not everyone else. Right. <laughs> oh, my God. That's crazy. <laughs> and also an invitation. Another thing I wanted to ask you is, the etiquette behind asking for just monetary gifts. And also a lot of people now are doing the info cards of like attire, like the colors they want people to wear and things like that. Yes. What is your take on all that? Um, I, for an attire, it's, a, it's really about, about like if that's something that you really want to do as a couple, then do it. If it's not an important factor, then leave it off. I would say then just go with like, you know, black tie or black tie optional or semi-formal. Um, there's, you know, cocktail. There's so many different ways you can say it. it. But if you have a certain color tone and you really want to make sure that all your pictures have those color tones, right. then I would do a card. If the, um, the, what was the other item that you were talking about? The, um, the so the color card and then card. adding, you know, when people just want monetary gifts. Okay. Or no children allowed. That's so, another very controversial one. Yes. So I would probably put like a little blurb on my website for those types of things. And I would not actually even say anything about monetary. What I would probably do is offer a, um, offer a link from your, on your website to your, you know, usually when you sign up at a, um, a department store, it will automatically link to your website. Yeah. And so therefore all your guests can see what you've signed up for. If you don't have a lot of things on there, more option, option you know, more app than not, they'll go ahead and um, give you money. I mean, and, and a lot of it also ranges from um, the the culture that you're from. I was going to say that because I did receive an invitation where there was like dollar signs and I knew what that meant. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to know, is it a common practice still? No, no. In fact, I do. I Personally, I discourage it because my feeling is, is when you put on a wedding, your expectation should never be, my feeling that you shouldn't ha expect to get a gift. It's something that is a given, but it's not, you, you don't ask <laughs> for it. I was going to say, it's like, you know how they say it's like common sense is, it's The common sense, sense, right? Yeah, it's like you're going to a wedding, you know you need to bring a gift, but right. 
Isn't it crazy that some people, if they don't see it on invite or somewhere, they just won't show up with a gift? Exactly. And then the other idea is that you can always set up for like, you know, if you don't know. A donation. A do- or, or either, like a, either a donation or either maybe even like a, a wedding fund for your for your uh, uh, honeymoon. honeymoon? Mm-hmm. Like a honeymoon fund. It, actually, Honey Fund itself. There's actually a company out there called Honey Fund. Um, and oh, yeah, and so Honey I think that com. <laughs> right. So you can do something like that and put it on your website, but it's sub, it's kind of like in a subliminal, like here's where we're at, but you're not asking for for gifts. And a lot of the let's say anyone who is like a very like a what really 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 wealthy client, they they'll ask for a donation to a certain association yes. or uh, you know a certain charity that they're very close to. Correct. And how do you, like, in terms of the invitation, do they add that as well, or is that in the website? Um, Sometimes they'll put it on an enclosure card. I I always say, you know, when you're doing your actual invitation, this is something that you're going to have forever. So think about the fact that you don't want something on there that you're going to look back at and say, oh, I really shouldn't have put that on there. Um, And, I mean, it's kind of like... Keep it very simple and clean. Keep the information timeless. Timeless. So I think that's probably the best way to describe it. Okay. Now, when it comes to the different, well, some of the different things we've talked about, what would you say is one of the most challenging factors in your industry? You um, can be honest. I'm trying to think. <laughs> challenging. Challenging in the way of. Is it dealing with very indecisive clients? Is it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think indecisiveness is probably the the hardest part when you don't know a client and they're not being in, you know they're not providing you with information or again they're holding back on their actual costs and they're making it seem like they have this big you know like don't worry about the price I'm not, I'm fine with the price and then you go in and it's there's a lot of time and input that you have to do to give a client a price so when you're putting all that time and effort into something and then you're like ways off, that's, a, I mean, I learned that early on is that that's a hard struggle because you don't want them to be, you know, you don't want your clients to be dissuaded by the fact that, you know, we're ways off because then they're going to be discouraged and, and it's like, you know, oh my gosh, and then they feel embarrassed. So you don't want to make them feel embarrassed. And I think the best way to overcome that is, you know, is, is if you're the client, to be upfront with what your needs, your expectations, your price point of where you need to be. Um, and, and I mean, don't always go by what you're seeing online too, because a lot of times you'll see, oh, well, you know, an invitation only costs $1.50 a piece. Well, there's a lot of factors that go into $1.50 a piece. Mm-hmm. You'll have a couple that might be a DIY client where yeah. they're not factoring in the time, the labor, and all of those extra things that it takes to create that item because they're doing it themselves. So they're not thinking about those things. They're only thinking about, okay, well, I went to the store, I paid, you know, 50 cents for this paper, and then they're not really thinking about all the other factors that are involved. So I think that's something to think about. Um, Think about all the time that it's going to save you by having somebody else manage it. Right. Um, Those are probably the key elements, I think, when it comes to you know, and, and obviously, you know, the style, the yeah. client expectations, and, and obviously the style, because when you haven't thought about your style, your personality, and so forth, and you're not being clear, it's hard for us to figure out what who you are. If we don't know you, and you're coming in to see us, then I think that's something that, you know, it's just be clear with your message as well. I think that's so important what you just said, because you have to know who your client is in order to design for them. Yes. So what is your consultation process? Like you meet with the clients and then like, do you, like what are some of the things that you really focus on in that consultation? So I initially used to meet with people and we would talk about, like I would, I would ask a few questions on the phone. Now I'm getting to the point where I do a lot more virtual conversations mm-hmm. first to find out what their style is. We talk about certain aspects about the wedding, you know, all of the details that we can in advance. And then when we do the in-person appointment, or if we have to continue on virtually, because some people are not local, then we can still do it virtually. But I think that initial conversation is about the aesthetic and so forth. 
um, that can be a, you know like a 30 minute conversation um, and then when you come in person um, I like to be prepared and bring the things that I know that that client is going to be fulfilled by what I'm, what I'm showing them. I don't want to bring, bring something. Bring samples of the kind of color aesthetic exactly. and the kind of like what their wants and needs are according to whatever you spoke about in the consultation. Right. That's yes. good. Yes. So I think that's the most important part is like just basically listen to your clients and for the client to be more for you know forthcoming with what their expectations, needs, and desires are. Absolutely, I think that's key. And as you're getting your clients, how do you go about getting clients? Like when you're first starting, I want you to think about like, how did you go about saying, I'm gonna get this client? Like, what were some of the things that, did you have to hype yourself up? Did you have your elevator pitch or like your pitch practice? <laughs> what was some of that like thought process? Yeah, so I mean, I, always been into the industry for so long. Yes. Um, I had a lot of connections. I had people that would refer me. Um, I do, um, you know, I was doing a lot more um, trade shows back then. Mm -hmm. um, nowadays, I don't do as many trade shows um, just because, you know, it, there's a lot involved with it. Um, but I think that, you know, trade shows are great for when you're first starting out, uh, just to kind of get your name out there. Um, and then, you know, keep your overhead low in the beginning. I think that's really super important because, um, you know, it can add up very, very quickly. I mean, it's, you know, to, to get samples, to, to have all those things, those all cost money. So there is, you know, that involvement. You know, there's also the marketing and all your education and so forth. Those all add up. So you do want to make sure, especially in this day and age where <laughs> we have a lot of online courses that you can pay for and things, you want to make sure you're being, you know, you're doing your due diligence to make sure that you're being accountable to yourself. Yes, because knowledge does get, does brew that confidence for sure. Yes. And in terms of not only getting the clients, but then also thinking back on this right now, like where do you see your company going? I think right now I'm actually getting more into, as I mentioned before, the um, the online virtual appointments are becoming bigger for me now more than ever just because I find that when I'm with a, with a client, I tend to focus, I, I tend to give a lot of time and uh, as do much- you give yourself a time like, okay, only a, it's like 30 minute consultation or an hour consultation? I do, it, I typically say your first appointment in person when you're doing your like, you know, you're going, I say schedule, plan out for an hour and a half because you're fine tuning so many details of all the components as well as the verbiage and I think that an hour and a half really should cover it. Yeah. Um, your initial consultation uh, virtually can be like 30 minutes max. I think those are the two areas. And then when you're doing your pickup, you want to make sure to inspect everything. You know, do your do, you know as a as a customer or a client, you want to make sure you're doing your due diligence to make sure that everything is there. Because once you leave, you know, if you you know. If, if something is missing, if you're not working with me, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> if you're working with somebody else, you want to make sure everything is there and, and everything has done, been done to your satisfaction. It's very hard to go back after the fact. And also, make sure to order extra in advance. Always order those, you know, you might order like 15, 20 extra, but you're going to use them. You're going to use them for your photographer and your videographer. You're going to need them if you want to have any saved for posterity so that you don't have any scratches or so forth mm -hmm. on the cards. Um, and also for the fact that if you decide you want to add people on, That's you want to make sure that you've got those extras because if you have to go back and order more invitations, it then typically counts as a new order. But it's more money. It's more money because your run. base price starts with the lowest threshold. Sometimes they can be in increments of 10, sometimes they're in increments of 25. Yeah. And sometimes it could even be that, you know, if it's like a, a custom invitation, they may have a threshold, you know, depending on the company that I work with, because I work with multiple companies, it could be a minimum of 100 pieces to get wow. that price point. So, you know, those are the, the points that you want to make sure that you're ordering enough in advance with your initial order. Amazing. And being that you are, listen, you're a busy bee. You're always I on am. the move and on the go. <laughs> you're involved a lot in networking events like Marcy. Any event, you'll most likely see Marcy there. She's definitely um, amazing at networking, <laughs> which before I get into the whole networking process, yes. how do you balance running your business and also, you know, 
networking and also still having a family. <laughs> yes, yeah, so it is. It is a challenge. You know, as we as people who typically will own a business, um, they're usually very giving with their time and they're very involved. So like when you have that downtime and you're sitting there and you're thinking, oh, I've got, you know, just one more thing, you know, one more idea, one more this, one more that. You do have to take time for yourself. You do have to take time for your family. Um, and the reason why it's important because you want to make sure that when you are showing up for your clients that you are showing up in full, not partially. You want to be there. You want to be present. You want to be an, uh, you know, an active listener. I think that's so important. Um, but, you know, balancing is, is tough, especially, you know, at certain times of the year, especially with regards to, you know, attending networking events. Those, that's your time that, you know, that's part of your business time that you're actually working, even though it may be fun and exciting, it's still your time that you're taking away from the rest of your day in the office or with your other clients or with your family. Those are all things that, you know, are, you know, factored into my week. So I typically will plan a week out. I was going to say, I'm like, I, you must I'm have always a calendar. Looking. Oh, my you calendar. You must be very organized. You have to be very <laughs> organized. I am, I am very detail-oriented, um, which from my industry, you have to be very detail-oriented. Um, but You I, cannot forget this. You can't, a, imagine forgetting one of the little <laughs> RCP cards. Could you imagine? Not only that, I mean, could you imagine putting the wrong date, things like that. I mean, you just you have, have to double, make triple, sure. triple, triple check. check. And exactly. That's stressful. Wow. It's very so yeah, I mean, it, it's but you know, I mean, those are why it's important to make sure you're taking time for yourself, but also make sure that you're being present and active. You know, being an active listener and 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 not just that. You know, triple check, quadruple check your work. <laughs> yeah. It's so important. Absolutely. <laughs> and what would you tell a creative entrepreneur? What would be some key tips you would tell them to find a balance? Like, what would be some mantras or some steps or what could you share on how you do it? Like, so I typically will do it where I mean my my social media, although I really need to get working on more flat lays <laughs> in my business. Um, I do put some um, some positive messages on my social media because I think that in order to stay grounded and and um, you know happy, uh, you know it's important to to kind of have those those elements you know and if you're having like i mean like this obviously we've had a i don't know if anybody knows this but we've had a super busy week with with rain here oh and my god so today Beyond i woke busy. up <laughs> i mean it's the, the waters have been literally like waist high There's enough people with kayaks in miami it, yes like, yes in the streets <laughs> exactly in fact we have a kayak a rowing kayak and unfortunately it's in our storage because oh. we sold our house and we were like we put it in storage and it was all the way in the back and i'm like oh my gosh this is the time to bring this it is up. the time we need it <laughs> and we're over by the beach so oh. it's like oh my you know, they were really high but i mean i think that you know it's really about um you know making sure that you're able to be um you know on point with everything and i mean like today i woke up i was like oh my gosh more rain more i know we're going to get more rain today and i said i i really need a bright color because i need to feel happy and i oh, need that's that. amazing so, so I, I do things just little things in my life just to keep my my energy up. energy up yeah that's amazing okay yeah. so that's one tip what's another that's one another tip i mean uh, one tip uh another tip would be um you know obviously the point the messages putting out their positive messages try not to get into uh you know the politics of life yes. that we see online i see a lot of people put politics online and i just stay away from that um how do you and that's important as i think as yes. a business owner for sure because yes. You want to stay focused on your business and making sure that you that you are just being very respectful, especially as a yes. business owner. When you that's why I always say I'm like have a business account for your social and then your personal if you want. Right. So on your personal, you can have all your friends and then you know post whatever. But in your business, keep it to your business, like posting your work, posting quotes that are you know in brand with what your brand is. Right. And I, and I think that's really the, the nuts and bolts of it. I mean, I used to leave it on my personal. I don't put any any politics or anything of that nature. You know what? People have different viewpoints. So, yeah. you know, rather than cause controversy and lose friends over things, you know, why? I, I don't think people realize that, you know, I mean, I've seen people cut other people out of their lives 
so I think those are kind of things that you know, like you you want to. Why do you need to get into that lane? You know, yeah. When into the you, mud. <laughs> when your pay should be about your like the the, the right. main thing I think uh, to remember everyone with your business account is make it about what you love doing, which is like showcasing your work. Yes, because. Instagram, like I always, people laugh when I say this, but my hairstylist, my lash artist, my brow person, I found on Instagram hashtags. I found them all through Instagram. Really? That's fabulous. All of them. And then my hair guy, I've been going for like nine years. The lash girl, like five years. And it was all through Instagram hashtags. And when I went to their pages, what I loved is that it was all focused on their work. So I was able to see like picture, like oh my god so many pictures of different hair colors it was nothing about him and like where he's like nothing and i didn't know nothing about the owner it was more like the style the, the style the work yes. and then same thing with the other ones and i always laugh because i'm like that's he has his personal which now obviously we're friends but i think that's a great mix because mm -hmm. on his personal he says wild things but then i'm like <laughs> it's good he has the business one i'm like you can vent there but it's nice to have that balance i realize it's very important for entrepreneurs it is i mean you know the other thing is, is I mean, like if you're having a down day or something, don't, I mean, I see a lot of people put things like that online. Nobody really wants to hear that. You know, I mean, unfortunately. You wouldn't go rant about a client who upset you. Like, you know, no, that's not gonna be it's, good. You know, you don't know who's reading it. And I mean, I love my clients as it is anyway, so it's not a problem. <laughs> good, good. So as a designer and also as a future bride-to-be, I have one store that I cannot stop going to and that's event decor direct event decor direct has your one-stop shop for all decor items from fabrics to hardware to ceiling draping to dance floor wrap prints and so much more it is honestly obsessing how much i can just look through here and i'm like hmm i should add that to my event as all of you that are listeners and viewers you get i wet uncut 11 as your code to get 11 percent off on the website all you have to do is put I went on cut 11 to get 11% off and you will see that your design process will become so much easier. So whether you're a designer, a bride to be, or someone who just loves the industry and loves designing, this is your one stop shop. What would be another thing? Um, another thing would be one last one. Hmm. I mean, get out there and listen. I think that part of the part of the whole process is really learn to be an active listener. Because when you're not listening, you're not, you're, I mean, in, in being present, I think, I think that when, we, when you're a guest at an event, what, whoever's event it is, whether it's family, friends, whatever, I think sometimes we get so inundated with our, our phones and taking pictures and so forth. And I think that you're missing out on the opportunity to really be present. I mean, I have to say, I went to my nephew's wedding this past week and I, did, I think I took one picture. I yeah. just, I wasn't, I, I want to be, I like you to, want be, to present. be present. Yeah. And I think that we don't always do that enough. I think that people, they're, they hide behind their cameras or if you're walk, I mean, like even walking down this, down in the hallway of, of a building that you live in or uh, where you work or something, and you, you're constantly seeing people on their phones and, and they, they don't even say hello anymore. And I'm like, say hello, you know, like. That's just who it's I so am. True. It's so true. It's true. You know. That's a true so I think point. That's a, I think everyone's just like. They're um, so focused that they're not present. That's, yeah. So I think those are important things. It's just, you know, it's life is about the time that you're spending with the people that you surround yourself with. And I think it's important. I mean, I do a podcast myself. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's important that you're listening to your clients, your people who are obviously on your show, you know, your family members, your friends. I mean, it's just, why not? If you're in the, if you get in an elevator and you don't say hello to the people that are standing there, I just feel funny not saying hello. And I think a lot of that also stems from the fact that I worked in a, a very exclusive hotel for you know many yeah. years, and I think that that kind of was instilled at me, you know, into me from you know my earlier years. But I think that's such an important trait to have, especially when you want to. You're in a creative field, right? Yes. And you know, and we'll get into your networking. You have to be out there hustling and networking and building connections and relationships. So imagine you in an elevator and you just being rude and you never know that might be someone down the line that like you work with or collaborate with or you might need a helping hand from, but guess what? You were so rude that they don't even want to work with you. Right. Like, you know, if anything, right. they spread rumors about you. 
<laughs> so that's why it's important to, like you said, always just be kind. I mean, you may get in an elevator working for a company and your boss, who you don't even really know, like, you know, maybe the owner of the company yeah. might be there. And if you don't say hello, what is that person going to think of you? I mean, you would, you just it's never like know who you're just going proper etiquette. to bump into. Proper etiquette, for sure. Yes. Which now takes us to a point of your networking. You yes. are amazing. Listen, <laughs> the, they, you're on it. Tell me, what is your secret, Marcy? How do you do it? Because I'm pretty out there with networking, but no, you take the cake. <laughs> you take the cake. How do you do it? I think it's just something that you, I, I mean, I, I, and this is funny, but people don't realize this about me. I'm more of an introvert than people what? realize. Yes. No way. I am. And, and this, no way. No way. <laughs> yes. Really? Yes. I am. But I think for me, the way that I've overcome my, I would say deficit is that I do go out, I do get involved because I think when you get involved, it makes you more confident. You become more, um, more active and I think it makes you more educated in your field. So I think no matter what industry you're in, the more involved you are, the more you're going to feel that comfort and confidence. I can't believe I'm, yeah. I'm still in shock. So how? <laughs> I know people say that all the time. You're an introvert. No, because I yeah. could have like an extrovert. But that's amazing that you said you've applied it to push yourself. Yes, I mean I took on the role of a presidency at a time that was like a rough time, and and I I had no idea what I was doing. You know, I mean I knew enough, but it you know when you go from one position on the board to a, a much higher position. There's a lot of steps along the way sure. that you don't always know. So I just challenged myself to take it on and, and go for it. And I think the only way that you are going to overcome your fears is by taking things on that may be more challenging. Yeah. So basically being bold and going and go for, for it, it. <laughs> even if you're scared or nervous, even if you're scared. Or whatever the feeling is that that's exactly the way to yes. do it. That's amazing. So how do you get into these networking events? Like, how do you, you know, like, do you look for it online? Is there a schedule that you give yourself? Yeah. I What's mean, your secret little antidote for that? So I'm actually a member of several organizations. And so I receive their emails. And that is when I will be able to go ahead and schedule them on my calendar um, and paying attention. I also pay attention to what is going on. Like, if I'm putting something on my calendar, whether or not it's for a client, myself, um, or you know, if it's a if it's a, uh, a networking event or something, I also look at the day and the week because I try to pace myself out so that I'm not too um, too stressed. Um, you know, I, I have you know a little bit of some health issues that I have to be more conscious of um, because like I have fibromyalgia, I have a few other things that are autoimmune related. So for me, I have to keep my my pace. Um, more even tempered so that I am not feeling that stress that you can feel from taking on too much. Well, you are a, a, a bad, like a baddie <laughs> because you handle it amazingly yeah. because again, you are still very active in yes. the design industry and then also you manage your business and also you have your family life. So right. you're, you're killing it. <laughs> <laughs> so you should be very, very proud of yourself because that's Thank amazing. Not, and it's now learning that you're an introvert. I'm st like I said, I'm still processing <laughs> it. But it shows you that all of you introverts out there, you can definitely get out there and be more extroverted. Yes. So I love yes. to hear that. Yes. I mean, it's, it really is about challenging yourself, pushing yourself, um, and just managing your, you know, it's like, you know, you, you want to manage your client's expectations, but manage your own expectations too. Like don't take on more than you can chew. I mean, and there are sometimes... I still get overwhelmed, but you know, you just have to find a way to rein it in. Yes, for sure. And what would you say is a motivational quote or something that you can offer to our listeners and viewers? Hmm. I would say be kind, be courteous, be active is probably my personal quote. Um, and then oh, I mean, for me, it's always about refining and it's about refining your calendar, refining your your brand, um, and you're constantly changing. You know, when you 
when you have a calendar of you have a task list to do, no matter what it is, even if it's you know going to the store and buying something, you know, you're constantly saying, okay, well, what's more priority over something else? And you're constantly having to do that in any any company. You know, you're constantly refining things for yourself. So listen to yourself and listen to others. That's amazing. And Marcy, I don't know if you want to close with any closing remarks, but it's been a pleasure having you on the podcast today. Thank you so much. You shared it's so really many golden nuggets. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I love, you know, I love doing this. It's, you know, it's an exciting opportunity to get out there and give people a glimpse into something that they're not necessarily aware of. And so I'm happy to be here. Thank you so much, Marcy. Make sure thank to you, Lucy. Thank you. Make sure to follow. She has her Instagram handle up and also her website. Make sure to check it out. Marcy does amazing, beautiful work. And this is just little glimpses of what she does. Make sure to check out her website. And thank you so much to all of you for watching and listening. And make sure to catch the next episode.